Hi, and thanks for joining us. Uh, this is Stops in Music History, and my name is Ella. I work at the Laurel Branch with my co-worker here, uh, Martin Seaboff, who you may recognize from Great Decision series, if you have made the Great Decision and signed up for it in the past. Uh, today, we're going to be talking a little bit about music, and by we, I mean mostly him, since he is our music expert here at Laurel. Um, and I'm going to be adding some things at the end. So Martin, if you want to talk a little bit more about what we're going to be doing today, that'd be great. Sure, we're going to be taking a ride through music history and we're going to be stopping in all kinds of places. We're, we're not sticking to one genre, one time period, one anything. We are going to be going throughout the musical universe. I'm very excited. Uh, Martin could talk for hours and hours about music, but we're going to try to keep it relatively contained. Um, we will have a link to a playlist that we've created, so if you're interested in any of the songs that Martin um, or I talk about, you will be able to access them later uh, to kind of hear what we're talking about. But for now, um, we're just going to use our words, and I think we are going to get started, I believe, in the golden age of rap. Stop number one is the golden age of rap, and you may say, Martin, why would you start a music history program with one of the genres that has been around the least amount of time? And I'll tell you why. Because I think rap gets, does not get the credit it deserves for having a great history. And the golden age of rap, in my opinion, was the late 80s and early 90s. Rap was considered to be originated in 1973 by Jamaican DJ Cool Herrick. And he was a DJ in the Bronx, New York. The first rap record is almost unanimously said to be the Sugar Hill Gang's Rapper's Delight from 1979. It made the top 20 and was the first rap record to gain popularity in the mainstream. To the late 80s and early 90s, where there was an abundance of meaningful, hard-hitting, and terrific rap groups and records, there was Public Enemy, with albums like It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back and Fear of a Black Planet and the single Fight the Power, which was featured in the Spike Lee joint film, Do the Right Thing. Stone Loke had the top single of 1989 among all genres with Wild Thing, and in 1992, Dr. Dre dropped the classic, The Chronic. But for my money, and where my recommendation is to you to listen, was the group Gangstar. They had, their main, they had a number of big albums in the 90s, but the one that I would recommend listening to is called Daily Operation. Gangster was one of the most influential rap bands of the 90s and were given credit by many for starting acid jazz or jazz rap. Other purveyors of jazz rap include A Tribe Called Quest, Digital Planets, De La Soul, and The Roots. So you talk a lot about um, having rap having jazz roots. What, is it, what does it mean to have jazz roots? Well, it, it's a good question, Ella. Um, what it means is they, a lot of the bass lines, um, a lot of the rhythm sections you take from jazz directly. It also means that a lot of the samples they use go from jazz directly. So a lot of the samples that these bands were using where they might be taking something from Miles Davis, or they might be taking something from John Luke Ponte. But they would do little samples from jazz groups and have a general tone of the jazz in the background while still having rap and heavy bass lines in the foreground. Huh. I did not know that. I was one of the many people that assumed that rap was relatively recent. So um, I'm, already, <laughs> I'm already learning a ton. I hope our viewers are learning a ton because um, I did not know that. So, that's so a rap started with Drake, right? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, kind of. Um, but I, I think that'll be a common theme of you telling me something and I'm like, oh, I didn't know that and never thought to think that I didn't know that. So uh, thank you for sharing and answering my question. You're very welcome. Stop number two in our music history is with the god of folk rock and is one of the most talented and influential folk rock artists of our time, the legendary Richard Thompson. Thompson is particularly renowned for his songwriting and guitar playing. Thompson first gained prominence in 1967 with the British folk rock group Fairport Convention as its lead guitarist and principal songwriter. In 1971, he left Fairport to form a band with his then wife, Linda Thompson. Under the moniker of Richard and Linda Thompson, they produced six albums culminating with one of music's greatest albums of all time, 
Shoot Out the Lights, featuring blistering guitar work by Richard on the title cut and incredible vocals by Linda on songs like Walking on a Wire and Did She Jump or Was She Pushed? Very optimistic songs, as you can see the Thompson, right? Shoot Out the Lights, in my opinion, is the single best look at Richard Thompson, and really Linda for that matter as well. In 1983, Richard and Linda separated and began a remarkably consistent so solo career with lots of good work and a few notable highlights. The album Rumor and Sigh in 1991 contained a number of them. Thompson's song 1952 Vincent Black Lightning about a motorcycle was named one of Time Magazine's top 100 songs from 1923 to 2011. And the song I Feel So Good, I'm Gonna Break Somebody's Heart Tonight was the closest thing to Richard Thompson ever have to a big hit single. So, so my first question is, who named these songs? Because they have pretty like aggressive titles. Um, are they <laughs> mostly Richard? Where was Linda involved too? Um, um, Richard is the primary songwriter. There was a song or two that Linda would co-write with, but all these song titles, both in his solo career and in his um, career with Fairport and Linda, he was the principal songwriter. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, well, it's fancy. Um, so you, for no, stop number three, you're going to talk about classical music, and I am really interested to hear you talk about that because I often forget that that's a part of music history. <laughs> And actually, classical music is probably the greatest uh, bit of beauty music history if you talk about historical, with a lot of the main purveyors being in the 1700s and 1800s. So we're going to talk about the three Bs of classical music. And those are usually referred to as Johann Sebastian Bach, Ludwig von Beethoven, and Johann Brahms. Sometimes they're even referred to as the Holy Trinity of classical music, with Bach as the father, Beethoven as the son, and Brahms as the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Many con critics consider Bach as the greatest composer of our time, and it's really hard to argue that, because to me, his organ works are his greatest gifts to us. Two compositions that show his great talents are his The Art of the Fugue and St. Matthew's Passion with the Art of the Fugue being the greatest culmination of all of Bach's work because of its astounding technical craftsmanship. A good start for enjoying Bach is Tom Koopman's complete Bach organ works, but any place that you can just get a good, art, good artist doing Bach's organ work, you're really gonna be in good shape because the music is so good in itself. So people, I won't say myself, but also maybe myself, um, might imply that classical music is a little boring. Um, and I know you, <laughs> you did mention um, the technical skill, but for someone that doesn't listen to a ton of music, I don't know if I would appreciate that. So just as a general statement, what would you say to people that are like, ah, oh, classical music is boring? I would say you haven't listened to enough classical music. Um, <laughs> I really would. I think if you go back and listen to, for instance, Beethoven has such innovative works. I mean, if you go for, particularly to his Ninth Symphony, I mean, you're just going to have tremendous, exciting works of music. And then I would also say is if you just don't like the overall structure of classical music, some people might say it's a little too much, you know, strict composition. I would say there's modern classical music you could listen to. Philip Glass Ensemble would be one I'd go to. He does a lot of the PBS program you've probably seen and said, well, that music's neat, but you never knew it was Philip Glass Ensemble. Uh, Steve Reichs does a lot of really good stuff with trains and a lot of stuff combined in classical music. And then if you want to get really avant-garde, it's like Kronos Quartet, where you can hear them doing a cover of Jimi Hendrix, Purple Haze. So I would just tell you that if you're really interested or anyone out there interested, um, is just to go and really explore classical music further because it's the farthest thing from boring that you can come up with. For some reason, I thought that classical music was long, long ago. Um, <laughs> So I, I appreciate the examples because I did not realize that there were people still making classical-esque music today. Oh, um, yeah. And it's such different to this stuff than from the, you know, people back in the time making it. Um, they're, they're really using a lot of 
innovative things. Some of it's very repetitive, like, you know, bill of glass is considered repetitive, but it's also neater. They add a little bit more uh, bass and percussion to the modern classical music, for instance, or like Steve Reichs does, like I said, a lot of stuff with trains and et cetera. So I think, you know, there's just so many inter interesting places to go in classical music if you know where to get, know how to get there. Well, I think that's fair. And I think you gave a lot of good examples. Um, but now I want to swing us around because I have heard through the grapevine and also through our programs at the Laurel Library that you have the scoop on the local music scene. So I'm very yes. interested to hear some recommendations from our local uh, DMV area because, you know, all oh. these bands are great, but who do we have at our front door? Ah, uh, yes. I I'm always excited to do this scene because, you know, living in the D.C. area, we do have one of the best local music scenes. Uh, you know, if you live around the country, you know, like my family from Pennsylvania or other people in other places, you, you don't really appreciate how good the D.C. scene is when you live in certain other places. Oh, well, you know, Athens, Georgia, Seattle, they might argue with this, but as a whole, the D.C., the DMV has one of the best local scenes in the United States. It was powered for many years by GoGo -Go Music, WHFS, and WTMD from Towson, Maryland. One of the groups highlighting the local scene is folk rock group Illy Amy, which stands for I Love You and I'll Miss You. Aww. Illy Amy, isn't that, isn't that just sweet? That's so That's sweet. sweet. Yeah, how can you not like a band called that? Aww. Illy Amy is fronted by Rob Hinkle and Heather Aubrey Lloyd. And Hinkle is kind of like an MVP of the local music scene. Um, he's just kind of done a lot of everything. He's hosted open mic nights. He's now hosting them virtually, so people can still participate in the middle of COVID. And for years, he's also been a participant in the Tacoma Park Festival. But a few years ago, it was canceled to lack of volunteers, and Hinkle stepped up to help and now serves as the program chair of the whole Tacoma Park Festival. He is also a terrific, terrific guitarist and songwriter. Um, Illy Amy is also fronted by Heather Aubrey Lloyd, who is a terrifically explosive singer and one unique, unique songwriter. Besides her work with Illy Amy, she has had a sterling solo career highlighted by the album A Message in the Mess, which is backed by The Novelists, another great band. The album received the Director's Award for Album of the Year for the Mid-Atlantic. Also a part of Illy Amy is Rowan Corbett, and he's just an incredible percussionist. If you ever get a chance to see him live, everybody, it's, it's worth the price of admission. He plays with Billy Amy. He also plays with Rhiannon Giddens in the Carolina Chocolate Drops. The Carolina Chocolate Drops have played at Montpelier Mansion in Laurel, while Heather Lloyd has played at our own local li Laurel Library. Yeah. She was so Amy. nice to you. Yeah, she was. Illy Amy has played at the Laurel Main Street Festival, so they really are a local group close to our hearts for those of us like me and Ella who work at Laurel. Another local act not to be missed on the local scene is the Eric Scott Band, led by bassist, yeah, there we go, Eric, led by bassist singer and songwriter Eric Scott. On September 11, 2020, he released his brand new album, Peace Bomb which he describes as a soul pop record that shows his love for 60s and 70s soul with his own modern twist. Um, Eric's a terrific live performer, terrific guy too. He, he really appreciates his fans and is really just a terrific guy. Also, of course, you cannot forget our local music scene without mentioning that we are in DC, the go-go capital of the world. And these are famous bands like Rare Essence, Chuck Brown Band, Trouble Funk, and EU, which for the in the know is Experience Unlimited. So I urge everybody, if you have questions or you want to get more involved or hear some great local bands, definitely, you know, send us an email, give us a call, whichever, because there's so many great bands, and I just wanted to highlight a few of them today with Ella. You had me for a minute because you had mentioned that, um, Heather Audrey Lloyd was backed by the novelist, and I thought for a minute you were talking about our online resource uh, for book recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I didn't know they partnered with people. 
Uh, <laughs> the children, you know, as a, a library, I, I use the novelist a lot to recommend books to people. So I was like, oh, all right. But no, there are so people beside music tonight, you'll know that we also have novelists to recommend books. So you learn something here besides just music. Explore novelists, whether it's the band or the database, like you, you know, wherever you want to go with that. Um, but that's, that's great that all these bands are super involved in their community because I know, like we said, you know, Heather Audrey Lloyd was at our library. Um, she was nice enough to, to come and do a concert with us. Um, and she even wore one of our summer at library shirts, which I thought was very endearing. Um, and she was super she nice. Did. That's, you know, yeah, it was nice. She put on, it wasn't like she gave a 15 minute show either. She did a whole hour show, really put her heart and soul into it. And, um, you know, it, it was really great of her to come. Definitely will be a highlight of my, you know, stay at the Laurel Library. I am excited um, that you mentioned that we, you know, I know you personally, so I can reach out to you whenever I want, which is a privilege that I abuse. But um, I, I do encourage people to reach out to us for recommendations because I feel like normally if I'm looking for someone local, I just kind of walk into a local, you know, what word am I looking for? Venue. Um, and I'm like, okay, I've heard of this band, but I never heard of this band. And I look them up and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Um, but I think now that everything's still kind of closed, like it's hard to find local recommendations. So I definitely do encourage anyone that's looking for to support their local artists to reach out to us because I might not have a lot of recommendations, but Martin has a ton of them. So yeah, I, we, we, we'd love you to reach out. Very excited. All right. So we've done the local stuff. We're moving out a little bit more with some modern blues and we are focusing on a person that you call the Texas Blast. Yes. Something called Think the Texas Blast. Think off the top of your head. Yes. Think off the top of your head, Ella. How many great musicians come from the state of Texas? I, could, I couldn't tell you. Like, 230? Like, I'm, and, and, you know, I... <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Most people would probably guess that Stevie Ray Vaughan is from Texas. How about Beyonce? Oh. How about Willie Nelson? Buddy Holly? T Bone Walker? Erica Badu? Roy Orbison? Janice Joplin? Lyle Lovett? St. Vincent? ZZ Top? And Miranda Lambert are all from the state of Texas, just to name a few actually 12. And now number 13, Gary Clark Jr. Gary Clark was born in 1984 in Austin, Texas. Gary's music is a conglomeration of blues, rock, R&B with elements of rap mixed in. His 2012 album Black and Blue, in my opinion, is his most complete album and particularly shows his R&B and rap weapons with songs like The Life. His latest album was released in 2019 called This Land, and he won a Grammy Award for the rock song also entitled This Land. If you are looking for a new great guitarist to discover, or what modern blues, in my opinion, should sound like, I recommend delving into Gary Clark's two best albums. So I, I have a question for you. What is modern blues? Because I think like classical, I just think of things that have happened in the past, but what is, what is a modern blues? Well, modern blues actually, uh, again, takes a little bit more from R&B, and it's a it's generally a more polished sound, I guess would be the way I'd put it. It's produced a little heavier. They use a little bit more of soul and R&B music rather than uh, straight blues shuffle. So if you're looking like for modern blues artists, Beside Larry, Gary Clark, Robert Cray is another one that people often mention as being a particularly good modern blues artist. He has a big song called Smoke and Gun that was a big, big hit in the late 80s. And so modern blues tends to just, as they would say, maybe clean up and dress up the blues a little bit. Oh. I've never heard that saying, but I trust you that people say it. All right, so we are going to move on, I think, to one of my personal favorite genres, um, which is rock. And I believe you're going to enlighten us about the many variations of rock, because there are 
so many. Yes. And this, I can see, would be one of your favorites, Ellen. Maybe a lot of people listening in who are saying, you know, when are we going to get to some of the newer stuff here, and you know, instead of going way back in time? So, yes, I look just like Buddy Holly, and you are my Mary Tyler Moore. The great pop rock outfit Weezer sings on their second single from the Blue Album. And yes, Weezer's Re Rivers Cuomo does indeed look like Buddy Holly as does Marshall Crenshaw, who played Buddy Holly in the film La Bamba. So who was Buddy Holly? Now that we've gotten totally off track here, Buddy Holly was a 50s era musician who had a great influence on numerous rock and roll's most famous performers. His own hit songs included That'll Be the Day, Not Fade Away, and Crying, Waiting, Hoping, among many others. Weezer is a modern day zany Buddy Holly with a ton of feel good fold feel good, excuse me, fun songs like Say It Isn't So, Hash Pipe, and El Scorcho. Weezer recently released their first single from their upcoming album, Van Weezer, entitled The End of the Game. And yes, this is Weezer emulating and paying tribute to one of their favorite bands, Van Halen. Rest in peace, Eddie Van Halen. And yes, rock and roll still marches on. If you truly want to experience the best of Weezer, then the blue and green albums would be where I would start with this great band. I will, I'm glad you mentioned Weezer because when I talk later, Weezer was actually set the foundation for what I'm gonna speak about, which for now is a mystery. Um, but I'm glad that you didn't bring him up. And ah, so yeah, it's a little, little teaser right there, but. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we've done a lot of really fast paced stuff. Um, but I would like to move on to, as you call it, the soul of relaxation. And Lord knows we need it. We all need to relax, not just you, Elle, in this case, but from COVID to the upcoming election to are we going to have a job tomorrow to I love my kids, but they're driving me freaking crazy. And when and if are things going to go back to normal, whatever normal means. As musician Bruce Coburn sings, the trouble with normal is it always gets worse. But in the meantime, we definitely have some things for you to relax here today. First, I recommend the music of Chardet, the smooth R&B soul operator. On October 9th, Chardet released a six-album vinyl box set entitled This Far, which includes all of her studio albums up to date. If you don't have your record player anymore, you can buy the CD or stream Chardet's albums. I recommend starting with either the Stronger Than Pride album or the Love Deluxe album, which features the Chardet classic, This Is No Ordinary Love. Another artist I recommend for relaxation is pianist George Winston. This is solo piano work truly at its finest. George has made a number of albums based on the season. And I recommend starting with Autumn and then going to his winter album. And if you want a little classic rock, like, you know, Ella I wanted, was dying to get the rock in here, you can get some rock and roll from your solo piano work and listen to Night Divides the Day the music of the doors. One thing I would like to point out at this point that again is not uh, strictly musical is my colleague Will Frolic Along um, airs a guided meditation program that's on most Fridays at four o'clock. Um, he's got a playlist of the meditations available to stream anytime at the PGCMLS YouTube channel. And the meditations are simple, they're straightforward and short. Most are only about 10 minutes, and they are written so anyone meditating for the first time can participate and get a lot out of it. And I know because I have participated and watched Will. And so he is every Friday or most every Friday at four o'clock, usually runs about a half hour or so, and his guided meditations are terrific. Uh, Will works over at the South Bowie Library and uh, is one of... Uh, good friend of both Ella and mine. Um, his programs are really good and relaxing. Um, <laughs> so Martin, you had mentioned records, and I don't believe it was you, I think it was our coworker Jim, uh, that was the first one to tell me that records come in different sizes, which I did not know. Uh, but um, I know that vinyl is making a comeback, 
So if you had to choose between vinyl and like CD, do you have a preference? Do you think there's like a, a big difference between them? There is a difference and I'll point out something before I answer my personal opinion on this is if you ask any music artist out there, I mean, it's like 99 to one. Every single one of them is gonna tell you they like vinyl better. Oh. They think the sound is more fresh. They think uh, it's more authentic. Almost every real serious musician is gonna tell you they like vinyl better. Um, for myself, it's a little bit more mixed. Um, I do agree that if you just give me a, a fresh vinyl record versus a fresh CD that I much prefer the vinyl as well. But you know, I'm old enough to remember the clicks and the clacks and the dust and all the stuff that happens to your vinyl records after you have them a while. Or if you have a favorite album, you sit there and listen to it 200 times like I do, you know. So I think it's more mixed. I think, yes, at its ultimate, I prefer vinyl, but still CDs are a little easier to move and they get, tend to last a little better a little longer. I think that I have really only had in my life, my lifetime, uh, the cassette and the CD. So it's been really interesting seeing vinyl in my experience anyway, making a comeback because uh, I didn't get that on the first rounds. Um, I know we're not here to plug any businesses, but where do you normally get your vinyls from? Well, um, Joe's Record Paradise in Montgomery County is the one of the main places that I get my vinyl from. Um, it's uh, Joe Lee, former son of the governor, Lee and um, also from uh, old WHFS, uh, Damien works there, Damien Einstein, which a lot of people listening to this probably know of. He was uh, one of the legendary DJs for WHFS in its prime. So it's a really good shop with a ton of variety and uh, couldn't recommend it any higher. Oh, I'll have to check it out when things uh, are more normal than they are now. Yeah. Joe's Record Paradise, people. You heard it here, folks. Straight from the source. <laughs> straight from the master. Uh, all right. So earlier we talked about a god. But now I'd like to hear about the master of jazz violin returning back to jazz in some form or another. Yes. John Luke Ponte, the master of the jazz violin, and he is without a doubt one of the premier violin virtuosos of the world. His unique stylings and innovative approaches have even had him compared to rock guitarist Jimi Hendrix, as in John Luke Ponte is the Jimi Hendrix of the violin. Ponte has had a long, successful solo career and has also had many collaborations with famous musicians in the jazz and rock field including Alan Holdsworth, Al Demiola, Stanley Clark, Bela Fleck, Chick Corea, Elton John, Frank Zappa, and John Anderson from the rock group, yes. If Ponte has a signature song or a most popular song, it might be Infinite, Infinite Pursuit, which was the theme song from the 1988 Winter Olympics. If you're looking for albums of John Luke Ponte to start your listening tour with, I recommend en Enigmatic Ocean, featuring the four-part title track. This album went to number one on the jazz chart and landed in the top 40 of the pop album chart. Ponte, always a terrific live performer, is shown in his best on Live at Cheyenne Park. And also, this album captures songs from all points of Ponte's long and prolific career, making it a great starting point for your listening pleasure into John Luke Ponte. So you said that he's the Jimi Hendrix of, I believe you said jazz violin, but you might have just said violin. Um, what does it mean to be the Jimi Hendrix of anything? What, yeah. is, what, does, that, you know, what does that even mean? Well, when you talk about Jimi Hendrix, you're probably talking about the greatest guitarist in music history and also the most innovative. I mean, Jimi Hendrix was just one of those guys that came on the scene and just changed the rock guitar. And John Luke Ponte is sort of like that with the violin. I mean, it, it wasn't a normal instrument that, you know, millions of people were playing electric violin and making them into rock songs, jazz songs, classical songs, everything. He just came on the scene and really reinvented how the electric violin was used and played. And so when you say somebody's a Jimi Hendrix or something, you're talking really two things. You're talking 
one superior prolific work on the instrument you know literally the best in the business on the instrument and then you're also talking innovation you can't just be a technical person you've got to be able to something that innovates others i mean the only one in my lifetime that i consider close to that would be eddie van halen the same way when he came with the rock guitar in the late 70s everybody from the 80s and 90s started playing like him because it was so different and innovative that's what you wanted to play like and that's sort of the same sense with Jimi hendrix or the same sense with Tom Lutz. Those are people you emulate and that were innovative when they came in. Awesome. That's, that's very high praise and also a lot of criteria. So, um, <laughs> the criteria <laughs> are mine. <laughs> you have to be this, this. I can see why he's, you know, the standard because very few other titles uh, would probably fit all of that. So, yes, I will accept a Jimmy. <laughs> Jimi Hendrixing as a criteria of things. Uh, so that's fair. Well, at this point, I think we're turning it over to you. Yeah. So it's now time to hear from Ella, and she's going to take us on our next two stops. Yes. So I'm going to start uh, with rock, and I'm about to start with the saddest rock I know, um, which is emo. Rock is probably my favorite genre slash one of the only ones I know. Um, but yes, I'm going to talk about the saddest music that I listen to, which is kind of emo leftovers from my high school years. Um, and there are a few different subgenres of emo, um, but I'm going to focus on emo rock, which is my particular favorite. Um, and kind of the emo subgenre slash subculture, um, what makes it emo is that it's usually associated with a lot of emotion and uh, sensitivity and it is actually um it started basically with the 80s with uh, punk culture in the washington dc area uh, so another great thing to come out of this local area um so it started with 80s punk it kind of went into emo as a beginning stage which was called emotional hardcore um and then that actually branched off into screamo which is emo, but a lot of screaming. And then where we're going to stop is the golden mainstream age of emo music, which is the 2000s. Um, but since then, it has actually gone underground, come back in the 2010s, and now is kind of all over the place. A lot of the bands that I liked in high school actually now do new wave music. Most people that were emo tend to be going new age, new wave music, so I'm not sure what the correlation is, but that is how they've gone. Um, so some of the bands that I think about a lot when I think about emo, high school, sad music time, um, there's the category of everything sucks and I'm angry about it, and that's going to be My Chemical Romance. Um, Panic at the Disco, both of those bands actually reject the title of emo, they have spoken uh, at length about how that culture of emotion tends to be focused on depression and self-harm. So they have actually talked in depth about how they don't want to be associated with emo um, because of that kind of like darker subculture. And then um, Fall Up Boy, I would also, their earlier stuff kind of being like, everything sucks and I'm kind of angry about it. And if you're familiar with any of those bands, you know that they've kind of branched away from that. Um, but that's kind of how they started. And then we have everything sucks and I'm sad about it slash everything sucks, but I'm going to like do my best. And that would be Reliant K uh, playing white tees and boys like girls. Um, and they are still emo rock, but they tend to be emo pop rock. So there's like a lot of different additives in there. Um, they tend to be more like upbeat, uh, but the kind of thing that brings them all together is going to be kind of that they are, emotional, shy, sensitive, angsty uh, kind of band. So um, as far as music that I think everyone should kind of listen to from these genres, um, My Chemical Romance, their song, It's Not a Fashion Statement, It's a Death Wish. You can kind of hear a lot of that like depressive, sad, angsty um, kind of feeling. And then um, Be My Escape by Reliant K is probably one of the most popular songs and that is more kind of upbeat and 
talks more about escapism, which I think is also a big part of emo music. So yeah. So, wow. Yeah. Um, what, in your opinion, Ella, now I get to ask the questions. This is great. <laughs> right. um, but for everybody out there, what do you think made emo music so popular for your generation? And when I'm defining your generation, I'm going to say late 20s to late 30s. I mean, I really feel like it really hit a special, you know, tide or feeling with your generation. And why do you think that really was the case or is the case? So that's actually a really good question because I do have a lot when uh, My Chemical Romance was saying that they were coming out with a tour. Um, Martin, as you know from personal experience, they sold out instantly um, anywhere they said they were going. And a lot of my friends were like, let's make a plan to fly to New Zealand to see them. Like people were really willing to throw down their money um, to see them. And I, I think it's because, so mainstream music, like I said, for emo was around the two, 200s. Um, it actually started with Jimmy Eat World getting a major record deal and then like everybody got a major record deal. And that was when I was like early high school, late high school, I was in high school, mid high school, somewhere in high school. Um, but I think that's kind of the time where you are angsty and sad and shy and have a lot of emotion. Um, usually that's when a lot of mental illnesses start to like kind of pop up so or at least get diagnosed. So I think that just the perfect mix of I am angsty inside and I'm hearing something angsty I think just really resonated. Um, kind of similarly I think when punk was really starting to come out there's certain age groups that it really hit hard and I think it just matched up really well with what developmentally was going on. Yeah, I know um, when uh, My Chemical Romance announced their shows, I mean, you know, those of us who, you know, stood in long lines for tickets to certain acts were, you know, I'm sort of thinking like, man, this is like the Beatles are coming, or this is like, you know, Van Halen's coming, or this is like, you know, you too. I mean, we, we it was just, you know, that show was announced and People were like, I don't care what else. I am getting tickets to that show if it is humanly possible. And they were willing to travel anywhere, pay any amount of money. I mean, it was, to me, it was amazing. But you could just tell that uh, there was a special connection between My Chemical Romance and its fans. I think it is just like something about being very open about being angsty and sad. Or angsty and angry. Mm -hmm. Angsty. Um, I think it really like, resonates with a certain age group. Well, I know Panic at the Disco's last album was just huge. I mean, it hit everywhere. It was on every station. You'd go down the list, it'd be on the album Rock, it would be on the top 40s. It would be on every station in the world, that last Panic at the Disco. So I know they really hit it big with the last album. His notes are incredible. And I love to play Hey Look Ma, I Made It after I present at conferences. So it's really good <laughs> pump up. Just good. Still, still to this day, really good pump up, really good like energy music. So. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. It's definitely one of those bands that, you know, if I'm doing, going to do something I really like or something that's a challenge, I'll crank up Panic at the Disco before heading out the door. Of course, I'm not your generation, for those of you shocked, um, but, uh, <laughs> How could you? but but I still like that music, too. You were going to tell us a little bit about the Matic bands, I believe, next up. Yeah, so um, we're talking a lot about genres today, which I really appreciate because I you know, like I said, with rock, there's usually a lot of different sub parts. But one of the things that I wanted to talk about is um, basically themed bands. And so um, I want to start with the difference between a themed album and a themed band. So a themed album would be something like Green Day's American Idiot, where the whole album is about a certain topic. Um, but after that album, they kind of don't revisit it again. Um, and it's also different than a themed costume, so like um, Daft Punk, they wear um, their helmets and they've worn them for, I think since the 90s, the late 90s, they started wearing their helmets um, because they didn't want to do interviews. Um, and they didn't want to appear in magazines, they wanted to be about the music, and then uh, 21 Pilots, also the lead singer, sometimes will wear a mask. Um, so there are like a, a few different bands that will have like a look, but that's not, it doesn't reflect in their music or they like Green Day have an album, but it doesn't reflect their look. 
Um, and normally you actually see this um, in like super specific theme bands. So um, pirate rock is like a thing that you actually probably will hear on like Renaissance Fair time. And so all of their songs are about the Renaissance or, or pirate, being a pirate. Um, there's a band called Battle Lore and their whole thing is Hobbit metal. And all of their songs are about Lord of the Rings. So that would be like a theme band. It would be someone that like all of their stuff is about a single theme. They might dress like that theme. Um, and they're usually very specific. So the bands that I really like that are themed like that, um, props to Hobbit Metal, but I really like a band called um, Starset. And they are kind of space themed. Um, so I actually saw them in concert. They will dress in astronaut-esque type uh, costumes, which they always have on. Um, the lead singer actually has a background in engineering and worked for NASA. So he is really familiar with space and, and things that are going on like that. And their concept is basically that they are working for an organization that's underground. They call the Starset Society. Their band is Starset. And they're fighting against like this, this organization, like this big bad kind of corrupt organization. But like all of their songs are um, space themed and they all have this like, we're in space and I'm running towards you, or I'm in space and I'm trying to get this message out. Um, and their costumes, not their costumes, I guess their costumes, their outfits are like that. Um, so they're ones that are a little bit newer. Um, but then Coheed and Cambria is actually based off of a science fiction uh, that was turned into a novel and comics. And most of their songs, if not all of them, are about this science fiction world that is a book. Um, and they're just songs about this like environment and they've pretty much committed to it. Like all of their stuff is about it. So I'm just really interested in the bands that are like, I really like this concept and I'm going to sing about it for the rest of my life. <laughs> wow. So, um, um, so and you said you saw Star Set in concert. Is there any others of those bands you've seen in concert? Because I would think um, without knowing that I've seen any of those bands, that it would make for a very unique concert experience. It, so um, to answer your question, no, I tend to, for purely getting bang for my book reasons, uh, I tend to see bigger concerts. Um, so like, like Warp Tour, where you're gonna see like a ton of different bands. Um, when I saw Star Set in concert in New York, they actually played at a little theater. Um, they were actually the closing act, they had some opening acts, but they took like a half an hour to set up because, you know, they had these kind of other bands and they were like, well, we got to get our spaceship out. So you're going to have to wait. Um, so I feel like theme bands don't often, unless they're like Kogi and Cambria and they're big and they're also not as involved. I feel like they don't play very often. Um, and I forget the second question you asked me. No, just to, have you seen any... Uh of the other bands live before and uh, is it a unique concert experience? Oh, that's the thing. One of the things that I thought was really interesting about their uh, concert is they had posters all around that had their like symbols because um, they, they have this whole lore. Like this, ha they have this whole just literature about their band lore. Um, so they have all these like alien like symbols and you could scan it with your phone and it would you know, it was AR, so it would like move around and stuff. And, you know, they had really cool lights and they had like the spaceship thing. Um, and they played, they had a screen behind them and um, they played clips of some of their music videos, but like the theatrical part. So it wasn't like them singing, it was them like running from the authority or like, you know, crashing on a space, like, a, you know, the very theatrical part. So it was, a, it was a whole experience. It was like a whole thing. Um, and it definitely was really unique. So they, they, um, they came out with a new album not too long ago, but um, if, you if you listen to one song by them, I would definitely recommend Halo uh, because it is about, as all their music, about being in space. Um, but it's also kind of romantic. I really like that. And it, they're worth watching the music videos for. 
because you can, it's almost kind of like watching a TV series. You can see what's happening throughout it. Um, and the is that going to be on our playlist that we offer people later? It is. So I did oh, add um, Halo to our playlist. Um, I think their whole album is on there. It's worth a listen. Um, that album specifically, I think, is their best. They have four albums so far, I believe. Um, somewhere right in the middle where they were really committed and probably not as tired, because we're all tired now. Um, but they were like really into the whole um, theme. They have some other uh, songs that are really good. Satellite, again, their songs are things like Halo, Satellite, Transmission. So there are a lot of like space communication themes. Um, and then for Kogi and Cambria, I don't think there's one song that really sums up their theme because their their whole dis discography um, is is the theme. But um, their song "Welcome Home" I feel really emphasizes their just their vocal style. So that'd be the song I recommend from them. But I think that we should, you know, we've been talking a lot about concerts and our experience of seeing music face to face and obviously that has changed, you know, there's no awesome concerts, we're not in any amphitheaters, um, and all of that's because of COVID. Um, so I'd be interested to hear you talk about kind of the influence that COVID has had on music. Well, yeah, and I think, you know, this is probably one of those things where you have the impossible job. Hey, Martin, let's talk about music and COVID and talk about, you know, some positives with COVID. It's like, come on, you've got to be kidding. But there is actually some great, great COVID songs that are out there. Um, I'm going to mention just a number of songs that are really good. And you might men hear some artist names. You're like, oh, wow, they did a COVID song. Oh, they did a COVID song. But I'm going to mention a few. And then I'm going to talk about a genre of music that really specializes in COVID songs that I think does it better than all the other genres out there. Um, Randy Newman does a typical Randy Newman ironic sardonic song called Stay Away. And you can kind of get the gist when you, just by the title. Um, the Rolling Stones, the world greatest rock and roll band does a song called Living in a Ghost Town, which is also um, a great COVID song. Now my personal favorite COVID song is by 21 Pilots called Level of Concern. And you had mentioned them earlier in your presentation. But it's really, really good. It's actually a danceable, grooving song that talks about the level of concern with COVID. Um, Benjamin Gibbard from Death Cab for Cutie also does one called Life in Quarantine. It's really, really, it really hits you in the heart. Um, but for me, the genre that does the best job with a COVID song is just country music. And you know what they say about country music? It was written on three chords in the truth. And there is some really good three chords in a true song. Uh, Dolly Parton does one called When Life is Good Again. And it talks about all the stuff she's going to do once COVID's over and she can get back to doing it. And it's very wistful and very wishful at the same time. And uh, it's a really great piece of work. Uh, Luke Combs does one called Six Feet Apart. Um, Ada Pambrick does one that's really also in the line of uh, like Dolly Parton's called Between Me and the End of the World. And then if you just want fun, Big and Rich also does one, and it's just simply entitled Stay Home. <laughs> Sometimes simplicity and messaging is the key, and it's just such a feel-good song about telling everybody all you got to do is stay home. There's no big things. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to be stupid. You don't have to be in great shape. You don't have to have the best idea in the world. You don't have to have a fancy car. All we want you to do is stay home. And that's big and rich. And it's a, it's a lot of fun for a COVID song, believe it or not. But I've listened to some of the COVID songs that you've, you've um, recommended. And I know that for me, I feel very comforted, but I also feel very sad. Um, so how, how would you say that you feel when you listen to these songs? Because I feel like everyone kind of you know, feels differently. I think that's a good way. I think some people, you know, are going to come and say, you know, the last thing I want to do is hear COVID songs. It's just, you know, I live with it. I, you know, I've had family members sick or, you know, and I can definitely understand that point of view. But for me, it really helps. I'm feeling all those things anyway. And then to listen to songs. And I like the different angles. Like I really like listening to, let's say, Dolly Parton 
and then filling that up then with big and rich and sort of chuckling and you know or randy newman you know being that just you know the grouchy old uncle type of song and then you know going to listen to something you know totally different than that so i think for me it, it helps i think you know i'm one of those that music almost always helps if i'm in a good mood i like to get songs playing get me in a better mood if i'm in a bad mood I like to listen to music to help me get out of it. So for me, it's very, very helpful. That's that's very, and I think that's a good point of feeling connected, you know, because yes, this is the time of of not being connected to anyone. So um, it's kind of nice in a weird way to know the world is kind of going through it together. And I hope that people watching this will let us know, you know, how they're feeling, you know, because I know we talk a lot Absolutely. about it in children's services, but. You know, we miss our patrons terribly. Um, so we miss being in the branches, you know, and open. So, uh, Absolutely. It's like, you know, the, what I got into the library job for was that customer service experience, the doing programs with people coming in and live performances. And we're just making the best we can do with something like this today. Yeah. So, so quick plug, if you're watching this, we miss you a lot. We wish you were in the branches. <laughs> We wish we could do more for you. And one day we will all be together again and not terrified that we're going to die. But until then, Amen. Stream, it into your Amen. Home. stream it into your home through YouTube or wherever you're watching this. So. Absolutely. So I know, based on your desk at work, that you have a favorite band. Um, he is known as the king of blues. <laughs> rock pop just a lot of a lot of words in there um so why don't you why don't you tell us about that i'll be glad to in fact you get to hear my two favorite bands coming up so this is the fun part for me coming up but uh here's i'm gonna do this more as a guess who it is um this artist has his this artist's greatest hits album has sold more albums than the beatles abbey road the beatles sergeant pepper Prince's Purple Rain, Bruce Springsteen's Live, and Tom Petty's Greatest Hits. This artist has also sold more albums than Rush, Green Day, Johnny Cash, Sade, and Earth, Wind, and Fire. Who is this artist we're speaking of? If you are watching this, I would like you to either yell at your screen who you think it is, Type in the comments who you think it is, or say it silent to yourself because you don't need to yell. You're in your own home. Um, while we're seeing what people are saying, I have no idea. I have absolutely <laughs> no. I've I would have guessed the Beatles because that's really the only big band I know. Maybe like Queen, but that's just because it's my dad's favorite band. Like I, I don't know. So. Martin, put us out of our misery. Tell us who's so popular. Well, some people call him the Space Cowboy, and some call him the Gangster of Love, but more people call him Steve Miller, and this is the Steve Miller band that we are speaking of. So what songs of his are so popular, you may ask? Well, you can start with 1982's Abracadabra, which was the number one song in the world that year. Then you surely must mention The Joker which not only was number one in 1973, it came back in 1990 and was number one again, largely due to a, a, Jean, a Levi Jeans commercial. Fly Like an Eagle is another Miller mainstay that has been covered by Seal, the Neville Brothers, Yolanda Adams, and Portugal, the man. So if you ask, where do I get all this great material and get the really best of Steve Miller? Not surprisingly, I would recommend his complete greatest hits, where you get all of his hits from early stuff like Space Cowboy, Quicksilver Girl, to later hits like I Want to Make the World Turn Around, and Wide River. Then secondly, I would listen to the album Fly Like an Eagle, which is probably the best single look at Miller's great gifts. It goes from the number one song, Keep on Rockin' Me Baby, to a cover of Sam Cooke's You Send Me, to playing blues with James Cotton. This album simply has it all. So if you're watching and have never been in the Laurel Library, this is exactly how Martin acts at work. 
So when we reopen, please visit us and experience this in person. This is not a one night show, people. This is all the time. Every day. Every day. Every day of every hour. Every day. So, so I have a huge question. Um, I did not know that about Steve Miller. Uh, is, is it Steve Miller or Steve Miller Band? It is technically the Steve Miller Band for ex all but one album. So okay. it is the Steve Miller Band, but the only constant is Steve Miller. The band has evolved through its, oh my God, let me count the years quickly in my head. Uh, it's evolved through the uh, 53, 52 years it's been around. So yes, it's, he is the only constant in the Steve Miller Band. That is so many years, but good, good for him. Good for him. Um, why you, you can't ask me because I don't know anything about music, but why do you think most people probably don't know that? Because I, that would not have been my first guess. Yeah, I think that's why I put that in there because I think most people don't know that. I think when you talk about, you know, if you mention Steve Miller, they'll say, heard him didn't he do fly like an eagle or maybe did the joker or, yeah yeah I, I remember that kind of and i think it's mainly because he's not a visual act i mean he was mm -hmm. definitely even though he was popular in the 80s um the videos that he did mostly did not include him and even as a personality he doesn't do a lot off the stage uh one of my favorite stories that i've heard him tell is that he can ride his bike before the show at his own concert and still not be recognized. And you think that's ridiculous, but you're seeing 20,000 people waiting to see this act. He's a huge concert act and he can ride his bike through the show or take a walk in the parking lot of his own concert that people are coming to and they don't recognize him. So I do think it's a lack of visual act or lack of being a strong personality. I think he's a guy that gets a real thrill out of just playing his music and live in a relatively private life on the outside. That's really interesting because, um, one, he's been doing this so long. So really, at some point, I'm surprised people weren't like, no, I'm going to figure out who this man is. Um, <laughs> and two, because, so, you know, like I mentioned in my themed band part, so many people go out of their way to make sure they're not recognized. Like, they wear costumes and masks and create these like personas for themselves. And he's just like, mm, I'm gonna be private and that's the person I'm gonna be. So. Yeah, it really is true. I mean, as he said, one other interview mentioned that, you know, he just goes out in the park lot when it's ready for the show, he puts his sunglasses on. That's his only dress up thing as some shows he wears sunglasses and that's it. Pretty plain and simple, just uh, does his thing, keeps his privacy and sells millions and millions of records. I believe it's 80 million records uh, total sold. But I have a follow-up question because you mentioned, you know, obviously that he is very private and the shows aren't very visual. Why do you think they're so popular? I think it truly is the, uh, you know, the quality of the music. If you look at uh, all those songs, it's a, he's had a special knack of hitting a vibe that people really want to hear. I mean, you know, number one song, not only number one song, but a number one song in the world. Um, there was even a 60 minute special where they talked about Russians who were going out and trying to get out to the other side of the wall at the time and trying to get uh, the copy of the single Abracadabra. I mean, it was just, you know, I think it just hits a real spot with people, his music. And he's had three big number one hits, Abracadabra, The Joker, and rocking me and then he's had just a slew of top 40 hits as well so it's it's i know when people go to the show it's always fun for me when i go out to see him play and take someone who doesn't know him that well and they're like i know that one i know that one i know that one i know that one how come i don't know him why is i know every song he's doing and it's just like yeah that's just the way it is so i think we have one more stop on one our, more. If you're still hanging people. in with us, we're going to let you go after one more stop here. Um, and it's uh, the cultural melting pot. I think a good place to end. Well, so Los Lobos, in my opinion, simply is the best music band in the world and also music's greatest live band. In just a few words, this band can simply do it all. Los Lobos has sold millions of records, won many awards, and received an abundance of critical acclaim. 
but perhaps its most lasting impact will be how well it, its music incorporates the American ideal of a cultural melting pot. In Los Lobos, you hear styles of music such as Nortenia, Tejano, folk, country, doo soul, R&B, blues, rock and roll, and punk, with several styles sometimes showing up in the exact same song. It truly is a group of superior musicians sharing interest in all forms of a varied pot of music. Lob Lobos is probably best known for its number one hit, La Bamba, but not to be missed is Shake and Shake and Shakes from many Los Lobos fans, including mine favorite album, By the Light of the Moon. Not to be missed is their most critically acclaimed album called Kiko, which is best heard as a complete work of powerful songs and great production. And what I would suggest with Los Lobos, sort of different than Steve Miller, is Los Lobos, I would tell people, you've got to go out and see them play. You know, once this COVID's done and it's safe, grab a ticket, see them anywhere, any place, any time, you're going to be blown away. With Steve Miller, get that greatest hits album and enjoy all those songs that you love that you didn't know were by him. But with Los Lobos, go see a show. It's just, it's mind-boggling. Now, what makes it so great live? Because there are a lot of bands that are really good live, but to say that you should go out and buy a ticket, like what, what makes them so good live? They can do everything. They're, they're, you know, it's, there's not many bands like that. They're going to start the show and they're going to be doing Spanish language songs and then they're going to be playing an accordion and then the next minute they're going to be playing acoustic and then the next minute they're going to be doing a version of Cream's Crossroad or Neil Young's Cinnamon Girl that are better than the original versions. Then they're gonna go back and do some of their own songs. And then they're gonna finish with five guys on acoustic guitars playing, you know, folk music from Mexico. It's just, it's just unbelievable the amount of great music and styles of music that you get in a show. And I, I just think anybody that uh, goes and sees them, I know one of our colleagues, Jim now is a big fan of, uh, Los Lobos because I dragged him out there, uh, you know, to see him. And it's the same way. He, Jim had a great comment. Sorry, Jim, should have asked you for the quote first, but I'm going to do it anyway. Don't worry about Jim. Okay. He won't mind. He won't mind. But Jim says, he says, I don't know much about music, but these guys are just ridiculously good. And it was just, that's the feeling again. I know the first time I saw him, I almost missed the show. I was doing a lot of other things. I forgot that I had tickets that night. So we ran out and saw the show, and it was like, oh, my God, I've seen a band. <laughs> <laughs> and now our special guest, Leah the Cat. Leah um, the Cat. And so, you know, I knew I would found a new band that was going to be a favorite band for life, and I really did find that. I love that. And for those of you wondering, how do you forget that you have concert tickets? You really need to understand that Martin, before COVID, went to a lot of concerts, just went to a lot of shows, a lot of concerts, saw a lot of people, went a lot of places I've never been. Um, so if you're like, you bought concert tickets, how do you forget? That's how. Just going out all the time. Um, so that is completely something that sounds like something Martin would do. Like, oh, I forgot that I had a concert tonight. I thought I just had one Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but I don't too. Um, <laughs> Um, so I think that is all the stops that we are doing, not to say that we couldn't talk for several more hours about music, and by we I mean Martin, um, but I could, I could listen to Martin talk about music for a long time, so um, if you're still with us, I really appreciate it. I know that, you know, this is a lot of really interesting facts, but we also was a lot of talking, um, and just as a reminder, we did make a playlist um, for you if you are interested in some of the songs that we talked about as you probably already imagine there's a ton of them of different genres and stuff like that so even if you thought nine tenths of this was not your style there's probably a song in there for you so check it out if you have a minute um let us know if there's any songs you think we should add to it we are definitely open to that if you need uh Absolutely. music recommendations martin is here for you um martin is there anything else no i think that's it and uh I would say uh, that's where you can find Halo, the song that Ella was talking about a lot by Starset um, is on our, that list. And um, yeah, if, if you have any other questions or anything, you can uh, definitely message us, at either one of us at any point, and we can uh, 
definitely give you more recommendations. Like Ella said, I could talk for hours more, but they keep it to an hour program, and it's probably a good idea. <laughs> yeah, so um, check out pgcmls.info uh, for more program information, and hopefully we'll be doing more music programming in the future, so keep an eye out for that. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for being with us.